Hello everybody and welcome to Amphrey Review. Today we're doing a double bill Hong Kong review for John Woo's Bad Tomorrow 1 and 2, two of the most iconic and infamous films of his entire career. You know, Hardball, The Killer, Bullet in the Head. These are big films, but yet yeah, I Bad Tomorrow is always on the top five list. It's always on the top, you know, uh, top three list of all time. It's constantly talked about on YouTube. There's scenes, imagery, constantly referenced, constantly brought up, and finally I managed to get to watch these films about two weeks ago. So now uh, I do apologize for not doing reviews sooner. I have been working a lot of hours recently since May 17th. Absolutely crazy amount of hours. I've just not had the time to sit down, do review, edit it, put together and upload it guys. So thank you for your patience. And I do really appreciate it. And now I can finally talk about both of these fantastic, interesting movies, I'd say. One that I absolutely loved, one that I thought was just a bit okay. A very compromised form. You're going to find out very much more why soon. So let's talk about A Better Tomorrow 1 and 2. The first entry for The Bear Tomorrow was released in 1986. This film he did after uh, Hero Shed No Tears, the year after he did the sequel, and then two years later he did The Killer. So this is kind of the very birthplace. This is ground zero, I would say, officially properly for his kind of brotherhood in arms kind of series of movies. Obviously the movies he did before this, obviously Hero Shed No Tears, it's a fantastic film, war kind of movie, very brutal and nasty. He did films like Hand of Death, Last Two Hours Chivalry. You can definitely tell when you're watching a John Woo movie in terms of his directing, his action, his cinematography. It's definitely his storylines. His storylines for his kind of, you know, dual personalities, brother in arms kind of storylines, his kind of bro storylines. Definitely in his early work, even his very earliest ones kind of thing with, you know, a very first early appearance on Jackie Chan and Hand of Death. You know, all of it's fantastic from the ones I've seen so far anyway, but I would say definitely, definitively, A Bear Tomorrow was the birthplace of this on the Grand Zero Four, this kind of wave of movies. The fact he did the sequel after, The Killer, then Bullet in the Head, and then obviously Hardboard, and etc, etc. You know, I think this is definitely a definitive version, starting point for that kind of new wave of movies. And you can definitely tell during that kind of time of 1986, you had a year before this police story. You know, this is a fantastic couple of years of Hong Kong movies. Great, what brand new wave of kind of heart hitting thriller cop movies. Everyone trying to reinvent themselves. A new wave of kind of, you know, going away from that kind of revenge, kind of low way kind of, you know, martial arts movie to more kind of grounded kind of thriller, you know, kind of kick ass action kind of movies. And this is a fantastic place to start. Better tomorrow is a fantastic first entry in this kind of wave of movies. Uh, the storyline follows uh, for Bad Tomorrow, it features mainly three characters, four if you count the villain as well, which I think it do count mainly, and it's classic John Woo in a nutshell, you know, where redemption arts kind of thing, brotherhood in arms, dual personalities kind of thing, forgiveness, uh, trying to make amends for kind of mistakes, and just all about character study, character motivation. The main character kind of is the called Big Brother in, in the film. He's a character that um, with his friend Mark, played by Chung Wong Fat, which is fantastic in the film. He's really great. During the start of this film, they're basically kind of money laundering kind of, you know, set up guys kind of thing. They're definitely criminals. They're definitely counterfeiting money, American dollars, passing it on, making a lot of money kind of thing. They're definitely top of their game. Definitely kind of very connected, very high up. And the first 20 minutes of the film is absolutely brilliant because you really get to know these two characters. You know, you get the, that iconic sequence with uh, Pong Chong Fat, uh, with, you, know, you know, lighting up uh, money kind of thing with a cigar. And uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I love that kind of imagery. And he's kind of very quirky. He's very kind of a, a ladies' man. He's kind of flirting, making jokes, and handing out money kind of thing. You've got Big Brother's character, which is the kind of the top dog, the guy that's running the whole business. You've got the friend who later betrays him, of course, in the film. That also he is connected with the kind of the kind of mafia organization kind of thing in the film and obviously he betrays these two guys kind of thing because obviously he wants to be better than them he doesn't like being beneath them even though he is sort of class of royalty i guess in a mafia kind of thing whatever but uh, yeah he takes the fall the big brother character does and mark becomes a bit of a lapdog towards the kind of the main villain character he's set a couple of years or maybe a couple of months after during the film, I can't remember exactly. I think it's about a year or maybe two years, kind of time served kind of thing. And things are very different. You know, he's come back, you know, and the organization has changed. He's the end of the guy that betrayed him, the guy that was kind of beneath him at the time is taken over. He's number one now and he's very slimy, very, you know, doesn't like him, but wants, wants him beneath him, wants him begging. And he's got a Mark's character, Puncture on Fat, which uh, he's basically been injured. He's got like a cast on his leg kind of thing. He's got scars and he's just pissed off. He's angry. He's humiliating himself. You know, he's telling stories about, you know, people 
putting a gun to his head and it's never going to happen again. If you're going to point a gun to my head, you better pull the trigger, that kind, that kind of attitude. You know, he's tired of the situation that he's in and, you know, he's gone from this kind of top, you know, organisation guy kind of thing, top of his game, you know, wealth kind of thing, power and, you know, that kind of cheesy factor to a kind of miserable, broken person, which, you know, he's overjoyed to see his kind of friend, his comrade again after so long, you know, and obviously he's on a redemption path, mainly to kind of make redemptions for himself, but also with his younger brother, with his kind of, you know, the younger brother, he's gone into kind of police force, he's kind of done the righteous thing, but he's gone to the more extreme ends, you know, but before they had a good relationship and they wanted to kind of, you know, have that kind of connection. Now he's trying to come back, he's trying to help him, but, you know, the young brother character, he is very angry, he's very kind of determined, he's kind of naive, you know, he's constantly kind of, you know, annoying his girlfriend Jackie's character, which is a very lovely character in the film, and he's just determined to bring down this mob, bring down this counterfeiting kind of firm, because it essentially costs you know, his reputation, because obviously he's associated with his brother kind of thing, so he's kind of making a very loud and clear statement that I am not my brother, I have nothing to do with him, I don't like him, I want to take this organisation down, but he's a bit of a, a loose cannon, a bit of a risk kind of thing, and, you know, he's just someone who wants to, you know, stop this from happening. And the core of the movie is this kind of three main characters kind of getting to know each other again and trying to find a kind of peace between all three. Three very definitive, very different character arcs in the film. Obviously, Big Brother's character, the main character, is someone who's very humble, someone who's very nice, he wants to try and help his brother, he wants to make that, he wants to fix that relationship. And Mark's character is someone who is kind of humiliated and defeated and just kind of broken and he wants to go a little bit of revenge kind of thing but you've also got the main villain character which likes to see them both kind of squirm or both you know he wants to prove himself as I can be the top dog you know very similar to kind of that bull in the head character as well who is someone who wants what's owed to me kind of thing and he's willing to go to extreme lengths to do that no matter what even just being your presence because obviously people naturally gravitate towards him because he's got that kind of reputation he's kind of got that kind of class in a sense and he doesn't you know you can't necessarily buy respect you can't buy fear classic kind of John Woo kind of dual personality kind of uh, parallels which is played in the film beautifully but the core film I'd say is a drama it is a a thriller definitely 100% but also it is a character study based movie between three characters that have to kind of find their own peace by the end of it and the core of the film focus heavily on that you've got a great segment in the film about a taxi service you know a bunch of ex-criminals that you know this guy is very generously bringing him into the fold a little bit and helping hey look you work hard you, do, you don't you know you fly right you know you can work for me you can do your rounds you can make your money you know this is a good holy place that's a fantastic segment of the film I think that's brilliant and I like, like to see that character step up and he does in the film he really helps him out with a kind of confrontation happens during the kind of the second and third act of the film putting it simply a better tomorrow is the kind of blueprint the origin point for kind of John Rue's later career now. A Bed Tomorrow is a fantastic pitch perfect thriller from start to finish that focuses all the attention on the right aspects of the film. It's got class, it's got great action set pieces, it's got brilliant characterization, it's got really like, excellent character journey for all three characters. You know, the, you know, you really invest in all three relationships, you get to know all of them. The supporting cast is great, the look, the style, the cinematography, the attitude of this film is fantastic. The hopeful nature of kind of friendship and brotherhood and brand new wave within kind of Hong Kong cinema during the late 80s, not just with John Woo but also with Jackie Chan, with uh, Wong Kai Wai, with uh, Johnny Toe. Fantastic series of movies all noticeably coming out within the late mid 80s. A new wave of movies, action, drama, kick ass movies, exciting movies that still stand the test of time, that are still delivering the chills, the thrills, the excitement, and the emotion within these movies. And that's something I always say within these videos, something I always say that Hong Kong cinema does so well. It has defining characters, it has defining motivations, it has defining emotional arcs, but also the action represents the kind of state of mind, the action flows through the story. Great story, great characters, great action, all combined together makes a kick-ass movie. And this is something that Hollywood has been trying to kind of cherry pick and doesn't quite understand. Sometimes it gets it right, sometimes it doesn't. Something like A Bed Tomorrow holds up so well and this needs to be celebrated and this needs to be get a bigger release. Hopefully Eureka down the line will release this properly in 4K. I know there is already a 4K brand new transfer from Fortune Star you can get behind Kong import which is fantastic definitely recommend getting that I'm hoping to get that at some point myself unless they do a Eureka release kind of double pack or something which would be fantastic <laughs>
A Better Tomorrow 2 was released in 1987, literally one year from that first film, which is absolutely crazy to think that Green let a seek for almost less than a year and made the film and got it on cinemas almost a year after. Crazy kind of turnaround time. But the first film was a massive, big international box office success. It was massive. I think everywhere, who everyone knew this film kind of thing, whether it's a Hong Kong cinema, whether it's American audiences. A Better Tomorrow was making big waves within Hong Kong cinema and influencing and impacting American kind of action set films kind of thing. Very small scale, low budget film, making big returns kind of thing. Really blew his up kind of John Woo's career, but blew his up all his actors. Mainly uh, Pong Chung Fat's character, we played character Mark, which was you know, taking a brand new life of his own kind of thing, almost bigger than the actual film of obviously people on the streets having bandanas and having the kind of a comic injury, with his kind of ruins, kind of a face bandage kind of thing. His character was bigger than the actual film. Now, my opinion for Bear Tomorrow 2 is a bit going to be a bit controversial. I think it's not everyone's going to agree upon it. I do have some very interesting and very kind of definitive opinions on the second film. I don't think it's as strong as the first film. I think it's a very heavily compromised film. Am I watching a John Woo movie? Am I watching a Troy Hawk film? Oh wait, it's a John Woo movie, it's a Troy Hawk film. This film is a mess. What is this? And, you know, I'm coming from a modern perspective. I'm watching both films back to back. The first film is a pitch perfect character driven thriller. The second film is two movies mashed together and it makes no sense. And I don't know if this is it's going to get better on a second viewing. I don't know if the this kind of mystery kind of two hour and a half cut of the film is even out there. Now, basically, the behind the scenes of Bear Tomorrow 2, I think, is even more interesting than the actual film itself, in my personal opinion. Now, Troy Hawk was a, obviously a friend of John Woo, kind of really helped his kind of career and obviously produced and helped co-wrote some of the movies here and there, even later on to do uh, Bear Tomorrow 3. Uh, which is, I haven't seen that, I don't know if it's available anywhere, I've been trying to find it, I can't yet, if anyone's got access to it, let me know, or send me a link or something, or point me to a DVD that I can actually buy and watch it, because I cannot find this film anywhere. But anyway, Troy Hawk and uh, kind of John Woo really fell out on making the second film, because John Woo wanted to make a two hour and a half movie, this is all down to kind of the things I've been researching, kind of finding out, he wanted to make a big epic film. It makes sense because, you know, he's got a bigger budget, he's got a bigger cast kind of thing, and he really wants to kind of elaborate and kind of continue on the themes and the ideas from the first film and just kind of finish this kind of the story, which I can definitely tell her watching the film. And, you know, both uh, <laughs> directors uh, had two different ideas. Troy Hawk is a great director. Now, I've mentioned him quite a few times. I really like Troy Hawk's work, Once Upon a Time in China series, some of the Van Damme movies, but he also makes some pretty crazy movies as well. Obviously, kind of the yeah, Zulu Warriors is mad. Yeah, despite what you think about the director in some of his kind of quality of movies, he's an interesting director and I really like a lot of his movies. The Master's great as well and um, he definitely saw potential in the secret second film but he wanted to make more of a light-hearted, shorter, snippier kind of comedy kind of action, easier to digestible, put in cinema's film. Obviously if you do a two and a half hour film, you can't have many showings in cinemas. It's a straight up fact. And this is something that still you know, haunts cinemas even today with obviously the kind of the four hour Justice League and the three hour version of uh, Avengers Endgame kind of thing. It's still a thing that happens even today. And a two hour and a half film in cinemas isn't gonna make much money back according to obviously producers and people involved trying to make money back and trying to make their returns back. So they both did two cuts. Obviously John Rue wanted a two hour and a half film. Troy Hawk wanted a much significantly smaller film. He wanted less than two hours, more of a kind of straight to the point action film with lots of comedy kind of thing and they both hated each other's cuts. Why are you the way that you are? Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. The compromise was give it to a third party that can just mash the two films together and this is what we got. This is the only version of the film as of this moment that is currently available. I think just about two hours or so kind of thing and it's a very compromised version. And the thing is, this has happened before. When you watch a John Woo compromised cut film, you can usually tell, this has happened within here, Hero Shed No Tears. That film was great, I really liked that film, but he had to make some sacrifices. There's a couple of scenes in that film, a couple of moments in the film, and uh, edits that he had to take away from some, some bits of the violence. He had to add some kind of nudity for some reason in the film because the studio and the producers wanted to add some unnecessary nudity to kind of spice things up a little bit kind of thing and you know those elements of the film definitely degraded just a tiny bit 
it's still a great film, but you can tell he didn't make those choices. He didn't want to make, put those things in. And watching the work print cut as well is interesting to see what his take was. Uh, same with Mission Impossible 2. Uh, you know, Hard Target is another one as well, another compromised version of that. Van Damme took more charge of that film. He edited the film. He wanted to make it more about him. But this film, I think, is a bit of a mess. And I don't think it's a great film, if I'm being absolutely honest. And that might be a bit controversial. I think you guys might, you might have your own opinions on that. You might disagree. It definitely has its moments. It's definitely a lot of great stuff in there. I like the continuation of the character arc story from the first film. It's great to see these characters again, uh, especially kind of, you know, the big brother and the kind of young brother detective working together on a case. Fantastic, great way to start the film. It definitely feels like a John Woo movie from that first opening 20 minutes or so. It alters so much between a slick kind of thriller to a comedy to a weird kind of random sub stories, some bizarre sequences, which I'll get into more later on. It definitely throws in uh, a character which really doesn't need to be in there. I think it's done to capitalize on the actor itself. I think he has some great moments. I think he has some terrible moments. The acting is so up and down. Uh, the third act is fun, but it's also really unnecessary. My opinion on this film, unfortunately, is a bit negative. I don't think it's a terrible film. I think it's perfectly watchable. I think it's a, an interesting watch to kind of see what the kind of the outcome from this kind of disagreement on two different cuts are. The character that basically gets kind of framed for murder in a sense, he, you know, he doesn't kill the guy. He's, he friends him with a gun, but he doesn't kill him kind of thing. And he has to go into hiding and, you know, this kind of this portion of the storyline is focused on this character which obviously he is wealthy he is obviously very connected but he's a witness and he's someone who needs to be detected so they send him off to the u.s they put him in a boat similar to the u.s and go and you know stay undercover go and you know stay with a bunch of people kind of thing and then it kind of deviates to a comedy out of nowhere now what this film biggest sin is and i think and i really don't like it and i think it definitely Im impacts the film is that obviously punch on fat is becoming the next big action hero and he's definitely becoming the next big star. So what do they do to throw him in this film? How can he be in the film from what happens in the first film? Of course, if you know what happens in the first film, how can he come back? That doesn't make sense. Oh wait, he's got a twin brother. Oh, it happens to have the same skill set, a similar background and a similar attitude compared to his brother. Oh, that's great, kind of thing. It's such a lazy introduction. I, I mean, they should have maybe a bit more tongue and cheek on it. Maybe they could have made a few more jokes, but it's literally a carbon copy of his brother. And it's a little too much for me to be honest, but it's such a deep disconnect to the main film because this character lives in the US. He's, he's a restaurant owner and you get a very bizarre sequence within a restaurant where this person throws rice on the floor and says, this rice stinks. And he comes in, sits down and says, this rice is my family and starts eating it. And this fucking fried rice stinks. Roy, just like my father and mother. Don't fuck with my family starts doing weird things with food and it's, it's a really awkward really strange kind of confrontation with a, just a random character out of nowhere and his reactions his kind of comedy is so what what am i watching kind of thing it's the most bizarre sequence ever how can you go from a slick thriller you know you know espionage undercover kind of storyline to this sequence and it just gets weirder and later on obviously they send the kind of informant the kind of character that's kind of the witness they want to keep alive kind of thing high stakes happen in the film which is great kind of thing there's some really tense kind of moments throughout the film which is brilliant when she goes back to hong kong and actually tries to be a, a bad tomorrow movie but it cuts back to america again you've got the informant the witness kind of thing that goes to live in a church someone who kind of knew him kind of thing and literally and this is literally within about 10 15 minutes he arrives at the church most folks in america goes to the church his friend gets established um you know the little girl does as well kind of in the whole family so okay it's good he's going to stay there he's going to you know something's going to happen later on but no literally he gets there establishes his characters they all get killed including the little girl which is quite you know shocking kind of thing he goes mad uh, the kind of fake kind of mark 2.1 character comes in for whatever reason you know, um, later on in the film, but he gets taken by police, gets put in a, in a mental institution, gets force fed like food, kind of mouth, and it's a really crazy, weird sequence, very Troy Hawk, sort of weird kind of comedy. Um, he gets busted out uh, by Mark 2.0, I'm gonna call him. And then he forces him to eat like an apple, banana or something. And then he does a very Marlowe drama thing where he's throwing and smashing food from the fridge on the floor. 
it's a very very awkward confrontation sequence which between the restaurant between the church and between mental institution and between force feeding this character a, a, a fruit and then getting pissed off because he doesn't do it and because he's like you know obviously mentally all over the place kind of thing with how it happened it's like what am i watching is this meant to be funny is this meant to be serious how again how can you go from a thriller to this material and think this is acceptable it's such a disconnect it's such a really weird kind of shoehorned in character that doesn't really need to be in the film this character you don't need mark 2.0 to make the film successful they did it for the poster they did it to get the star quality they wanted hey look here's the boys they're going to do a revenge kind of mission they're going to take out some bad guys cool if they insert his character right it might have worked there's potential with that but the fact that he's such a carbon copy, the fact that he introduced him so sloppily and lazily, and to give him a full-on action set piece within a kind of hotel sequence later on with his kind of military background with a shotgun, it's pretty cool. Yeah, great. Granted, it's cool, but it's such a such comes such a late into the game kind of thing. Both his characters travel back to Hong Kong later on, and obviously various kind of stuff happens. Consequences happen. A character does die in the film. Which is again a little bit poorly handled in my personal opinion. You know exactly which character I mean if you watch the film. But a character is yeah, falsely almost died during the middle act. And I thought that would have been a good kind of you know middle act kind of you know motivation for the rest of the characters to do what they need to do. He kind of dies later on, kind of thing, towards the third act, which is a bit weird kind of thing because you've already built that up, you've kind of misled us and then you did it again. And I don't know if it's serious again or not because you've already done it once, so you've wasted time. Maybe within a kind of two hour and a half movie, this would have made more sense. We've been more fleshed out, a bit more kind of certain scenes put back in. Maybe that would have made more sense. But ruin the state of the film is it happens very too, a bit too quickly for my liking. And um, of course, you get the most iconic third act action sequence piece ever. And this is a really brutal, very nasty kind of you know suicide mission. All the boys coming together, take down these kind of organization once and for all go in there, shotgun, pistols, grenades, nasty kills kind of thing, burning people kind of thing. It's it's a pretty brutal third act and it's, it's pretty cool. It's cool. It's a cool third act and I really like it. It's really well handled and it's, it definitely makes a statement on the actual film in terms of the story, in terms of it's done now. Despite the finale being so satisfying and being so awesome kind of thing in its delivery, it doesn't really justify the rest of the film. Uh, overall, my thoughts was it's just sort of okay. I think the film is so bizarre in its execution. I think it's so bizarre in its editing. I would love to see the original vision of the film, the two hour and a half version. Get rid of some of these weird kind of shoehorned in American sequences. This weird comedy, this weird kind of force feeding food sequences that kind of, you know, Punch on Fat is doing in the film. It's so bizarre. I do believe there's an edit of the film that does work a lot better. I think personally I can go in and remove a lot of those sequences and make it a much stronger kind of maybe 19 minute film that doesn't have kind of weird awkward kind of comedy in the film, weird kind of sequences that I don't need to see. Uh, there's subplots and the sort of characters that really don't have much stake in the film. They maybe do for the first portion and they kind of vanish and come back later on. Um, I don't, I think he misses a lot of opportunity. I think he could have really explored big brother and his kind of young brother in the film i think that could have been purely about them to bring jackie a little bit more into the film as well focus on that kind of relationship you could have focused on the kind of a like healing kind of journey between those two and being undercover being high risk high stakes kind of thing showing the dangers of being part of a mobster the danger of being a police officer undercover i think there's a lot of potential they really could have done to explore this and i think you still could have justified that third action set piece with the kind of the all-out guns blazing kind of sequence which is great but it comes so weirdly kind of phoned in and kind of thrown in there for excuse to do it, to sell a poster, to sell a trailer. It doesn't feel genuine and this doesn't feel truly John Woo for me and doesn't feel truly true Hawk either. So it's a weird mix of the film. So yeah, Bed Tomorrow 2 um, is a bit of a strange one for me. I don't particularly like it that much. I think it's not a bad film. I think it's definitely worth a watch for sure. I think there's a lot of great stuff in the film. I like some of the decisions. You know going towards you know doing more with the kind of the main characters left over from the first one but mark 2.0 very strange choice all of his sequences all his character makes no sense to have him in the film um he's practically just a carbon copy you know despite having some great action set pieces um it doesn't really kind of justify it i think some of the emotional arcs in the film are very compromised 
uh, especially we were doing kind of a false kind of death sequence and then doing it literally 20 minutes later. It's a very bumpy ride of a film. It doesn't quite hit its emotional strides. It doesn't hit its full story potential. It doesn't quite have the most defined action sequence, I think personally, despite the third act being quite good. I don't think the action is just a solid, I don't think it's as, as quite good as the first film. So there you go guys, been my thoughts and opinions on Bear Tomorrow 1 and 2. What are your thoughts guys? Please comment down below. Did you like both films? Do you love the second film? Do you think it's a compromise like I think? Uh, do you disagree? Do you, you know, Put your comments down below. I'd love to create a discussion on both films. Uh, very interesting kind of movies and I think they add something interesting to the kind of John Woo kind of mythos kind of thing which is great. I will be doing a review on the third film at some point if you get down to tracking it down. It's not available in the streaming service, not available on DVD. So if anyone's got access to it, it can help me out. Please comment down below or email me. Much appreciated. I'd love to review that film. Thanks guys for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. So in the meantime guys, I'm for reviews. So yeah.